Welcome to the General Resonance Theory YouTube channel. Today, we have a presentation on ultrasonic neuromodulation for enhancing mindfulness and well-being by Jay Sanguinetti. We now join this talk already in progress. Uh, so what I wanted to do is give you a brief overview and intro into Similab, which is what, uh, Sam, uh, what Tam was introducing and really get, give you an idea about how we're using ultrasound for brain stimulation, um, particularly with an eye towards general resonance theory and trying to test the theory. I know you guys have been putting out lots of papers recently. And one of the reasons I got interested in brain stimulation back in graduate school was this idea that you could use focused energy to test theories of consciousness and cognition. Because you can causally modulate brain function, uh, you can get a better sense of how either brain areas, or in this case, uh, resonant frequencies are involved in cognitive processes. So um, I'm happy to take questions throughout. Um, if you have questions about how some of this might fit in with testing GTR. Um, but I just wanted to give you sort of a sense of how we're using it, and then maybe where this can go for, for you folks. Um, I think most of you know that Maria Finney is uh, working in the lab now. And uh, so we do have a connection there to you guys through Maria. Okay, now I'm admitting people. I hope that's okay. <laughs> I'll take care of that, Jay. Um, I still can admit people, so don't worry about the beeps. Okay, sounds good. So uh, this work is mostly being done at the Center for Consciousness Studies at U of A in, in Tucson. That's where I am. But some of this work was started at the University of New Mexico. Uh, which is where I first hooked up with Shenzhen Young, and I'll tell you a little bit about the story with Shenzhen as we go through. Uh, my background and training was in philosophy before I moved into neuroscience, and most of the philosophy that I was reading was the pragmatic philosophers, William James, Charles Sanders Peirce. Uh, those philosophies have really impacted the way I think about science, and a lot of my push into brain stimulation as a pragmatic way to help people deal with some of the habits, uh, the bad habits of mind that lead to things like depression and anxiety. So I like this quote by William James where he says, could the young but realize how soon they will become mere walking bundles of habits. They would give more heed to their conduct while in the plastic state. We are spinning our own fates, good or evil, never to be undone. Now, it's a beautiful quote in many ways, because you know what he's saying is that if we could just lay down better habits in the beginning, uh, a lot of the issues that will emerge later in life would not, uh, would not vibrate out into our lives. But I think what William James didn't understand back in the day was that we're always in that plastic state, we're always learning and updating, and it's not as fixed as maybe he would have thought. Um, and now, of course, mindfulness and meditation, um, oh, maybe Maria is going to come in. Uh, of course, mindfulness is one way to undo some of those bad habits of the mind and lay down better habits. And so that's really the practice that we're interested in in the lab. Uh, hi, Maria. I think you're coming in. Um, really interested in uh, mental practices that help us lay down better habits and disrupt some of those negative habits. So uh, the Semilab stands for Sonication Enhanced Mindful Awareness, and really we're interested in these practices of mindfulness. I think, as all of you know, uh, in the science of mindfulness, it's been quite hard to pin down exactly what mindfulness is. And really we think of it as different things depending on how you're using this word. Uh, from a form of awareness, which is what we're interested in in the lab, to a set of practices that hone that awareness, um, also to a path. In Buddhism, it can mean a whole path uh, of, of life. Uh, the definition that I give in the lab for mindful awareness is paying attention to moment to moment experience with openness and acceptance. And that openness and acceptance is a very important component of what we're interested in stimulating uh, in the lab. Uh, Richie Davidson has very recently wrote a book uh, talking about moving from mindful states, which is what you're training through the practice, uh, moving to trait levels of mindfulness. And ultimately, what we're interested in the lab is not just the state of mindfulness, but how that mental training or that brain training leads to traits that change behavior in the world that ultimately lead to wellness and well-being. Um, so uh, I've been collaborating with Shenzhen Young. He's the co-director of the Sima Lab. And um, Shenzhen has a, a sort of different way of looking at mindfulness in, in the sense that he breaks it down into component processes. 
Um, and these processes can be thought of as attentional processes, like attentional concentration, sensory clarity is the ability to track uh, perception and time. Uh, sort of like if you're a baseball player, you can learn to track the ball better and better with higher resolution. And this other skill uh, called equanimity, which is really a skill of being able to be open uh, with a certain attitude of openness and acceptance to the experience. And uh, Shenzhen has really tried to quantify this method so we can operationalize these definitions and study each piece. Look at how mindfulness training elevates each of these attentional pieces. And then the claim here is that as you elevate all three and they start working together, that's where you start getting from state to trait level change. You start elevating those trait levels of attention all working together till you get a, a trait level shift in those abilities. So um, Shenzhen has been working very hard for a long time to try to operationalize and, and sort of uh, come up with a multifaceted view of mindfulness. Uh, now what, okay. um, yeah. So I was just on a walk for a month and actually staying uh, at uh, Maria's place and is actually a school just next to her place in, in Oahu um, call it, it's a elementary school called the, the mindfulness school and I'm curious mm -hmm. if you studied uh, the use of mindfulness techniques in school kids if you have an opinion on it can that be beneficial or not I know Jonathan has done some and I think his work found mm -hmm. that for young kids it didn't really help that much but I'm curious if you've looked, looked at that area or is that beyond your purview uh, yes, so we've worked with two groups and then Shenzhen's worked with a couple groups in Baltimore. And one of the things about Shenzhen's system that's a little bit different than like a traditional system um, is that it's really capable of being tailored to the individual uh, need of the user. So, you know, if you've got children, you, you have to sort of think differently about how to train them. Uh, it's a bit harder for them to understand a concept like equanimity, for example. And so Shenzhen came up with an approach he called Mind, Mind the Music, where he was teaching inner city kids in Boston, or sorry, in Baltimore. And uh, what they did is they did a little uh, open sample where they tried to figure out, you know, what do these kids think about mindfulness? Well, they thought it was weird. They didn't want to sit with their eyes closed where their friends would see them. You know, that was weird. So you had to get over the sort of weird component just to get them to practice. And so what they did is they actually had them do a focused attention on the music that they liked. And then they cultivated equanimity and concentration on the music. And they didn't tell them they were teaching them mindfulness, actually. They just told them, you know, we're helping you enjoy your music better. Uh, so they did an eight-week training course. And what happened at the end of the eight weeks is that the kids started going in and teaching their mentors and their parents and this was pretty salient because some of these kids were Muslim and, you know, teaching their parents this technique was actually quite controversial in some of the homes because it's, it's essentially a Buddhist technique. Um, they didn't get enough money to end up studying that, so they didn't have, ever publish any of that. But it was a case where it really showed that if you tailor the training really to the need of the user, you can get it to stick better. Um, I don't know if Jonathan has anything on that. Yeah, we. <clears throat> it's interesting. Uh I didn't know anything about this project, but we're doing a very similar project. Um, our app is called Finding Focus. It's used in high schools. And uh, just as you said, Jay, it uses music as the primary oh, cool. ground. Uh, yeah, and we've gotten, um, <clears throat> we have two published studies on it and a third one that is under review. And the third one actually has a uh, control uh, so the, the the first two were just pre posts and the third one had a uh, a control condition. In all cases, we got improvements in uh, focus. The I think I mentioned this. The app is called Finding Focus. Mm -hmm. Improvements in focus uh, and in well being. So very very similar logic. And we're just well, waiting. We've we've gotten two. It's been rejected. This was a research based on a big IES Institute of Educational Science grant, and um, which I've gotten quite a few over the years. It got rejected twice. It's now, I'm waiting any day now to find out about the third um, submission, but very hopeful that we'll get it on, on the third one. So uh, wow. yeah, it sounds um, very, very similar. And uh, Jay, happy to uh, share the papers and even um, create a, get you guys a link if you want to um, check out the, the app. It's 
<clears throat> Mike Mrazek is the was and Alyssa Mrazek um, uh, were the key uh, drivers of this project. Hmm, very cool. And Shenzhen would love to hear this because they never ended up, you know, getting this out beyond that one case. So sure, I'd love to. And if it would be helpful to get some input from Shenzhen's side, I think. Sure. Um, just um, let me just make. I don't have my thing. If you can just remember, if you just email me, um, sure. that'd be great. Okay. Yeah. No problem. Yeah, so you know, one of one of the cool things about Shenzhen's system, it's called Unified Mindfulness. If you're interested in looking it up, mm -hmm. um, is that he's now demonstrated in a couple of different cases. So they've used it in the business context. They've got you know some big companies using it, and uh, Adidas just picked it up. And again, with professional athletes, they didn't want to talk about equanimity either because it also didn't really fit their schema. So they used the word coolness instead of equanimity. And teaching them, you know, how to cool down, like if you're at the free throw line and it's an intense game, you know, applying some openness and acceptance to whatever emotion you're experiencing helps you let go of it so you can just do the mechanical motion or whatever. And so it's been really cool to see how he can sort of change the system for the different types of context. Uh, we have the same thing for college students, of course, we're doing this mostly on 18 to 24 year olds. And uh, equanimity, again, is a little bit of a hard concept for them to wrap their head around. So we're trying to figure out how to change the structure a little bit. So um, once you start elevating the core skills, so concentration, clarity, and equanimity, the idea is that those skills then start translating out into life. And that's really what our lab is more interested in, is how do we how do we measure the effects of the elevation of the attention skills or the cognitive skills in relation to changing behavior in life? And then does that relate to all these positive health benefits that we keep reading about from all of these studies that are coming out in the literature? So we know that physical health, mental health, and well-being all tend to be elevated um, by at least eight weeks of mindfulness training. Uh, really, eight weeks seems to be the lower end, sometimes you can get effects after four weeks, but really you need to do at least eight weeks or more. And once you start getting up to several years, uh, you start moving into this category of human well-being or human flourishing uh, that's really being uh, talked about by very long-term meditators. And so the lab is interested uh, sort of up front in these physical and mental health effects. So translating to people with depression and anxiety but ultimately, we're really interested in this far end stuff, you know, so what starts happening to people after 30 years of meditation? Why do they all seem so damn happy? Uh, why aren't some of them in existential crisis, right? Why isn't every one out of 10 long term meditators in some kind of uh, black hole of existentialism? You know, they, they don't seem to go there. They seem to go into this category that Flanagan called human flourishing. Um, and so that's really, you know, the sort of far end of, of all of what we're interested in. And the, the use of the neurotechnology, like the brain stimulation work is really trying to, to ask the question, can we elevate some of this good stuff? So can we help people get some of this mental and physical health stuff faster from the practice? So instead can I jump in on this for just a second? Okay, yeah. can, I, can I just offer a little commentary on that? Um, I'm, I've been a pretty serious meditator for about 17 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, that should put me in the well-being and human flourishing <laughs> category, sure. but um, it, it's a, uh, it's, 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 I was best described to me by a, uh, a Zen monk who I know who said, uh, sometimes it's like uh, sitting there and having a wild animal in the bed with you. Uh, like, like just sitting on the, like, it's like dealing with, and this is, I, I think, generally, a uh, there's some there's an article in Elephant Journal, I believe, that's a pretty good uh, distinction making between mindfulness as a practice, uh, which is steps away from some of the um, from some of the more some of the the pieces of uh, Buddhism, for instance, that deal with what comes up in the human animal. Uh, when you start encountering this weird phenomenon called emptiness mm -hmm. and uh, yeah like dealing with some of like the deeper stuff that comes out in meditation is really not a cakewalk and yeah. uh, and you can get to the human flourishing and I've seen many examples of that and felt many examples of that but there's 
there's um there's a lot that uh you wind up having to process along the way towards uh towards that and I think some of the I, I just I'm just offering like I, I think this is fantastic. It's beautiful. That's that's part A that I, I want to say. I was also just on uh, just in a seminar with another group that uh, that was looking at metabolomic, genomic, uh, epigenomic mark biomarkers of mm -hmm. uh, set meditation week long protocol and saw some pretty astounding. Uh, shifts mm. the number of uh of these markers uh which that work has not been published yet but it's by uh, a professor at ucsd named himal patel mm -hmm. and uh it, it was uh, to my eye the volcano plots that they were showing were like wow you're seeing really strong differences between controls novices and experienced meditators after a week of this stuff so wow. i just want to i just want wow. to offer that data point uh, as you're going, you know, you're looking at cortisol and blood pressure. This is a, this, this study was like a much more like pan omics kind of approach on plasma biomarkers. Uh, so my sense is that you're going to see something and also a cautionary note that, uh, how, how much sampling bias are you having by looking at, you know, blood pressure and cortisol, you'll see something, but like there are, there are many, 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 many things to measure in the human, um, in human samples generally. So, yeah. uh, just encouragement to maybe go broader in the case, case you can. So that's mm -hmm. all I have to say, but, uh, thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for those comments. Um, I can skip to the end of the talk where I, I sort of say, what if this works, this boosting technology that we're using? And then I give all the things that you just gave in the point A, which is there's a lot of stuff that happens in between like reducing blood pressure a little bit to the human flourishing piece. Um, so yeah, we I can pull that up now if you wanna get there now or we can sort of address uh, yeah, it later. I'll carry on, carry on, um, yeah. um, thank you. But yeah, that, that great point. Um, and yeah, to your point about measuring other things, so we've we've just started getting to uh, looking at cortisol in the lab, but we're thinking about looking at some other biomarkers that might look at some of these changes as well. So yeah. Um, so you might have seen this book recently, Altered Traits, where Richie Davison really digs into some of the things you were talking about, Andrew. And I like in this book, he's talking about long-term practice versus short-term practice. And he talks about the wide path versus the deep path. The deep path, I think, is what you're getting to, where lots of things can come up for people. I mean, even on a 10-day retreat, uh, it's not all good. It's mostly not good, actually. But <laughs> over time, it's, it's, it's very good for the person. Um, but most people are interacting with these practices, meditation, mindfulness, yoga, and other things in the contemplative space, and what Richie Davison calls the wide path. Um, so not a lot of deep practice on these things, but maybe you know, 30 minutes a day once a month or something like that using the call map. Um, and even that has some benefit for people. Uh, it's not likely to bring up a lot of the deep stuff that I think you were talking about, um, but it is likely to have some type of impact. So we're interested in that in the lab, but we're really more interested in the deep stuff that you were addressing and what happens when you start doing deep long-term practice. So multiple retreats a year, you know, practicing for multiple hours a week um, over years and years. Um, and how do, you, how do you quantify those effects? How do you deal with some of the negative stuff or some of the adverse events that can come up? And can we use both science and technology and um, the methods that we've developed to track people over time to help people steer through that so that they can get to the human flourishing piece without having to go through quite some of that, uh, but without blunting the things that are needed to get to it in the first place. And that's a whole can of worms, so we can, we can bring that up as well. Um, and you'll read from long-term practitioners like Shenzhen. So Shenzhen's been practicing for the better part of 60 years. Well, they'll say things like, once you learn to taste purification, this is a technical term from Buddhism, uh, your growth goes exponential. And so this is also a claim that comes out of very long-term practice that at some point you hit the inflection point and uh, human growth, human happiness uh, starts going exponential. Uh, this is a really interesting claim to me in the lab, and we've been trying to figure out ways to see if this is true, how do we quantify this, and how do we measure it. 
And we've been looking for ways to map this on to what's been done in positive psychology. Um, so you might know of like the PERMA model of human flourishing, where uh, they basically define most people in this state of languishing uh, towards doing mental training, where you're increasing your resources of mental wellness and dealing with a lot of those negative and adverse events that come up that Andrew talked about. Um, that ultimately leads to human flourishing, uh, which is a very hard to define uh, concept in the field as well. But uh, you can think of that, this in the way that the Greeks were talking about the good life or the life well lived. Um, it's a life that has deep meaning and purpose. It uh, doesn't mean you're always in this positive state of bliss, uh, but it means that uh, overall throughout the trajectory of the life, um, you're having meaning and purpose, good human connections, uh, probably has some measure of physical health. Um, whether you need a certain level of money and things like that is debated, but really means you're living in the good life. And the claim that comes out of deep contemplative traditions is that at some point you start, you do start moving up to this point. Uh, but unfortunately for people like me and Andrew, who've been meditating for 15 years, we may be here. <laughs> and, and what the claim is, is that once you get up to 30, 40, 50 years, it all starts going exponential uh, pretty quickly. Um, so, you know, that's one of the things that we're really trying to understand in the lab. One of the questions is when you start using things like psychedelic interventions, neurotechnology, neurostimulation, neurofeedback, does it make this go faster? And is that actually functional uh, for people to, to do? Or do you just create people who uh, have something like spiritual bypassing where they think that they're enlightenment, enlightened, but they're actually not able to go do their job anymore? <laughs> uh, there's lots of cases from retreats where people tend to have some level of what they would call an awakening. Uh, they leave their spouse, you know, they realize their relationships are dysfunctional, you know, you have all these things happening. Um, so the question is, you know, how quick can you make this go and how quick can it go and still be functional for a human being? And I think we're going to have to start dealing with some of these questions as psychedelic interventions, technology, and all of these other things start intervening in our nervous systems in a direct way. Uh, so we're really trying to ask some of these questions in the lab and trying to quantify uh, all of this stuff. Any questions about that? <laughs> So uh, Shenzhen has developed what he calls the periodic table of happiness elements. Uh, this is very similar to the PERMA model that's come out of positive psychology that attempts to quantify the component processes that would make up uh, human happiness or human flourishing very widely and broadly and deeply defined. So we're not talking about the state of happiness, but we're talking about if you have like deep happiness throughout your life, what are the core components and you know, what do they look like? How do they interact with each other? And in Shenzhen's model, this is all about mindfulness and meditation training. So the claim in his system is that as you train concentration, clarity, and equanimity, you're elevating deeper and deeper into each of these categories. So minimizing suffering, for example, uh, it's kind of obvious that you might be able to concentrate uh, in, in a certain way where you can eliminate undesirable objective situations. So you can focus and, and realize, okay, uh, putting myself in this situation is going to hurt me, so you can do something else. But as you start elevating concentration and equanimity, for example, you can actually move into abilities that are not so obvious. So completely experiencing an unpleasant sensory experience is not obvious for most people. Meaning, let's say you have chronic back pain uh, and you can't make it go away. Opioids aren't making it go away. Uh, meditation's not making it go away. You're stuck with that chronic back pain. Well, if you have a sufficient level of concentration and equanimity, you can actually go into the pain to the point where the pain breaks up or you fuse with it, you merge with it, you become one with it, you go into a non-dual state and you are the pain, the pain is you, everything is the void, you're done, <laughs> right? Um, so that's not quite so obvious for the average person, but that is a report that long-term contemplative practitioners have reported. Um, and so the sort of model at the bottom levels here defines the different levels of so-called enlightenment from the different contemplative traditions, uh, like the Theravada versus the Vipassana paths. Um, and the idea is that you've elevated all of those capabilities till you get to these, these levels. Can I ask a question, Arjun? 
Yeah. So um, these are all based on reports, right? From various um, levels of skilled meditators. Mm -hmm. So Shenzhen sort of combined this from different contemplative models, um, Theravada, Vipassana, um, some of the Zen traditions as well, and then added a little bit of positive psychology from the 1980s, I believe, is when he was working on this. So it's kind of a, a hodgepodge of different models put together. Do, do you know, is there um, any variety of quantification behind it? And I'm not suggesting that's a necessary good thing, but I'm just curious if this chart was created um, in a kind of a quantitative manner or is it more based on Shenzhen's, like you say, kind of surveying the field and saying this makes the most sense of the data I see in front of me? Um, it's more of Shenzhen's survey and, and Shenzhen's genius going into this. Um, we've been trying to quantify it um, recently in the lab. And there's another group uh, at Carnegie Mellon, David Cresswell's group, who's a mindfulness teacher, uh, mindfulness researcher. Uh, they're also trying to update this and quantify it in a way where we can actually use the data to reify and update the model. Um, the idea ultimately is to have an app, and uh, we probably don't have time to dig into this, but within, you know, everything in Shenzhen's model is there's levels of complexity as you go down. <laughs> um, so within each of these squares, there's actually four components. And what you could do is create a topographic map of someone's happiness. Um, because again, there's sort of wide and deep levels of all of this. And so uh, we've been trying to quantify it for each person. So you kind of get their topology. And then you would be able to show for that individual how the mindfulness training is changing the topology, hopefully in a way that is understandable to the user. Because ultimately, we hope this helps them get motivated to continue you know, down the path, essentially. Um, and what's really smart about the model, too, is that the, the individual meditator defines all of this stuff for themselves. So, you know, acting skillfully is quite different for a business person than it is for a professional athlete or whatever it is. Um, serving for love can be very different depending on your religious background, for example. And so the model has tried to be specific but generalizable all at the same time. Got it. Thanks. Hey, Jay, um, last time you gave a talk here, I remember you talking about like there's like three dimensions and maybe those are Shinzen's three uh, components that you set up earlier. How does that map onto these elements, if at all? Or in this topology, is there a link between these different elements or are they like sort of separate pillars? Um, good question. So each of the skills, concentration, clarity, and equanimity, is, I think is what you're de describing, uh, they will help you move down to deeper and deeper levels. Um, and, you know, concentration can help you more in one category than the other, but really they're all interacting together. And the more they interact, the more you can move down each level. But it, they don't necessarily just like just elevating concentration, clarity, and equanimity doesn't necessarily make you move down. So you also have to work with each of the categories. Um, for example, serving from love really helps if you do uh, compassion training, um, loving kindness, metta bahavanya. You don't have to do that. So concentration, clarity, and equanimity should help you um, be at service to others quite a bit more. But if you're moving to understand yourself, so doing some insight practice, that might help you sort of not get so carried away by your own individual needs, which helps you then serve from love, like help other people serve other people, that kind of stuff. So yeah, it kind of depends on how those skills interact with the other types of training that you're doing. AJ, what is a subtle service? Uh, deep fulfillment from subtle service. Uh, that's a good one. Subtle service. Um, so yeah, deep fulfillment from indirect service is uh, sort of like, you know, just doing things for people. Direct service would be um, sort of like volunteering work where you're, you're sort of intentionally signing up. Subtle service is getting yourself out of the way so that you're acting from the place of the other. Um, so it's sort of uh, the boundary between you and the self is being dissolved in a sense. You're sort of getting into the non-dual stuff down here at the bottom. Uh, yeah, but we'd have to have Shenzhen on. Shenzhen might pop in in about 30 minutes so he can answer some of these questions too. <laughs> so the word subtle in the same 
uh, sort of vein as subtle body like that. Yep, exactly. That kind of, okay, yep. Gotcha. Yep. So uh, anyway, I put this up to say, you know, getting back to Andrew's point that a lot of stuff comes up, the, the human identity and human system is very complicated. For most of us, for all of us, there's deep trauma in the system that comes up and there's a lot that needs to be cleaned up um, to put it, you know, in the phrase of some, some of the positive philosophers. Um, so, you know, we have this model in place to say that as we're trying to think about moving people towards exponential change, we're always trying to have this sort of uh, cognitive map of human well-being and happiness on top of the agenda, uh, because I think exponential change can get weird and uh, unuseful very quickly. <laughs> if you've ever done too much psychedelic, you know, it's not always the most uh, <laughs> functional place to be in. Um, so this is just kind of the, the direction of the map. And uh, what we're finding uh, is pretty obvious if any of you have tried to meditate, uh, you know, and not had a lot of experience with it, is that mindfulness is initially difficult for people. This is especially true as we bring clinical populations into the lab. Um, and not only is it especially true, but if you have a, an issue like rumination disorder, where you're thinking a lot about negative uh, information, uh, getting a person to focus on their thoughts actually makes their problems worse. So not only, so you tell them, okay, I'm going to give you all these positive benefits. I give them the slide. This is going to make you feel better. Uh, then you get that person to sit down and they start focusing on their inner issues, their inner suffering, and it just amplifies that suffering. Um, and so, you know, one thing we've really been trying to figure out is how do we use the tools in the lab to help people get over this hurdle? So not, not so that we can replace the meditation practice, but that we get over the barriers so that they get some of the reward from the practice sooner. They start coming to understand deeply some of what the practice can give them. And it really motivates them deeply to move into the practice in a way that's useful for them. So that's really been the drive to try to find out if, if brain stimulation can even help people uh, with meditation training. And uh, the... The idea that we've come up with in the lab that has now been uh, accused of being spirit tech is uh, combining non-invasive brain stimulation, so we're using uh, ultrasound, with mindfulness training over at least a two to eight week training course. Uh, since we're using ultrasound, it's called sonicating the brain, so the lab is called Sonication Enhanced Mindfulness Acquisition Lab, or the Sima Lab. And the basic assumption in the lab is that if we can elevate one of these core skills, so the baseline level through brain stimulation. Uh, so let's take equanimity, for example. If we can find some circuits in the brain that we think are uh, interrupting equanimity or interfering with equanimity, sonicate those, elevate your baseline level of equanimity, then as you train the other skills, you should be able to learn them faster or get more reward from them. That should lead to behavior change in the world that's pretty salient for people. And that should ultimately lead to the good stuff. Uh, the happiness, you know, deeply and broadly defined that we want to get to. And so uh, for the past two years, this is really the chain of hypotheses that we've been going after. Uh, first, asking this first question, can we use non-invasive brain stimulation to elevate equanimity? Uh, how big of an effect is that? Is that a good thing for people? Or is that something that actually is helpful for them? Uh, and how do they sort of psychologically or subjectively adjust to that? Uh, we're on to step two right now. So we're now actually, we've, we've done step one and it seems to be positive. Uh, we're on to step two. So now we're asking elevating equanimity. Does that actually help people train in these other skills? And does that actually lead to behavior change in the world? Uh, so we've just started these studies. Hey, Jay. <clears throat> um, out of the three, I feel like equanimity would be the hardest thing to modulate <laughs> brain stimulation. <laughs> right. Comment on that. <laughs> That's a very good point. Yeah, we decided to go big, uh, partly because Shenzhen's old. He's 77 and he keeps he keeps warning me and, and, and threatening me, basically, that he's going to die soon. So we have to just go for the hardest thing and, <laughs> and get it done. But you're absolutely right. Equanimity is the hardest one to go after. Um, for many reasons in the lab, it's really hard to define, you know, what is the openness and acceptance to experience? What does that actually mean? And how do we measure that? Um, we're, we're going after pain to measure that. So we're inducing pain in the lab. And if people have more equanimity, they should be open to the pain. 
Uh, Shenzhen's equation is suffering equals pain times resistance. Uh, so you can't remove the pain, but if you can remove or reduce the resistance through more equanimity, then you should be able to have less suffering and deal with the pain. So that's kind of the, that's kind of what we're trying to test. Uh, the other reason for this is that equanimity seems to be the underlying process uh, underneath a lot of this stuff that we're talking about. So equanimity, the way that Shenzhen has talked about it is something like the viscosity in the system. So it's probably not like one brain region where equanimity exists, but it's actually the way that information is flowing through the nervous system, specifically the brain, and the sort of stickiness or the viscosity around information flow. So if you think of someone with depression, we know that people with depression get stuck on negative information, so negatively valenced information. If you show them the word like Russia, you know, like, oh my God, Russia, the war, right? That information will loop, it'll get sort of stuck in the system and they're not actually paying as much attention to the other incoming sensory information. Um, you can kind of think of it like uh, sort, of, sort of like honey in the system, it just kind of sticks up. Equanimity, the more equanimity you have, the less of that, the less, the less viscosity you have and the more flow. And so if we can sort of grease the sort of information flow of the system with equanimity, everything else should flow, including learning is kind of the idea. So uh, we've been using ultrasound, as you know, to try to grease the wheels of equanimity in the brain and really trying to use this as a focus way to modulate into circuitry that we think is actually interfering with equanimity. So I'll give you just a little bit of information about what focused ultrasound is doing in the brain. Uh, this is like an insanely fast growing field. There's like probably over a hundred papers and humans coming out this year alone. Wow. But the basic idea is that you're focusing an acoustic beam of energy into the brain. And if you don't have the skull in a rat, you can actually focus that beam of energy down to subregions of the thalamus. Um, so like the ventral lateral pre, uh, version of the thalamus, and you can modulate sensory evoked potentials, you can modulate visual evoked potentials, I mean, you can get highly fine grained focused energy modulation. Um, this has really been possible in the last decade or so because ultrasound as a technology has really been taking off. Ultrasounds in everything, it's in cars, it's in the sort of uh, cell phone, you know, facial recognition, all of this stuff has ultrasound transmitters in it now. And so in the lab, we've really been taking that new technology and figuring out how to focus that energy into the brain to modulate brain function. Um, so I could give you a whole talk on all the cool stuff that's coming out with focused ultrasound. But uh, for one thing, for thinking about the G GRT and testing the model is that we're always pulsing the beam. So as you can see in this model here, the, the ultrasound is pulsed on and off, uh, much like repetitive TMS or transcranial magnetic stimulation. And uh, I've just written a book chapter where I've sort of speculated if that pulsed ultrasonic energy can actually modulate ongoing oscillations in the brain or whether we can actually drive those oscillations. Um, there's a bit of evidence from my lab and three or four other labs, uh, mostly animal labs, actually suggesting that this pulse rate could actually drive oscillations in the brain, which would be really, really cool if it could. And part of the reason that that's interesting is because ultrasound can reach all the way down to the thalamus in humans uh, with highly focused energy. So, you know, deep TMS may be able to do this, but ultrasound's on a totally different scale in terms of being able to do that. Um, so we can discuss that, you know, now or later if you're interested, but this is something that the grad student in our lab is testing whether we can actually, os you know, change the oscillatory dynamics of the brain with these pulses. Um, so here's just one what, case. What, uh, what frequency are you targeting right now, Jay? Uh, so we've tried with these pulse frequencies, this is called the pulse repetition uh, frequency of the wow. ultrasound. Uh, so you basically have a carrier wave of 500 kilohertz, and that's the ultrasound, and then you pulse it on and off. Uh, so the pulse repetition that we've used is 10 hertz, we've used 40 hertz, and then usually we're using up to about 1,000 to get outside of the sort of EEG frequencies. Uh, but very recently, we started using the theta burst protocols from TMS, and it looks like the theta burst is actually working a little better for ultrasound, which is also wow, true for awesome. TMS. So, okay, is that the 10 or is that like five, Jay? Uh, we're at five hertz and 40 five hertz. Five hertz for theta, okay. Yeah. Five and four. A couple questions. Sorry, yeah. Justin, go ahead, finish. 
Oh, sorry. So you're doing five and 40 hertz because theta was typically five and 50, but yeah, minor, yeah. probably the same. Yeah, we tried five and 50 too. It seems like five and 40 just felt better. So <laughs> a lot of stuff in our lab is sort of, you know, subjective. What does it feel like? And then we do the studies afterwards. So <laughs> well, when you're the first, you, you get to choose what you want. Everyone else has to copy you. So exactly. sorry, Tam, go for it. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Sorry to, to step on your, your question there. I, I miss just a very quick observation. Um, if we do agree that is decent data showing this uh, binary multiple hierarchy, then five and 40 would seem to make more sense than five and 50, because of course, mm -hmm. you know, five to 10 to 20 to 40 is just a, you know, a three-step hierarchy. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, those numbers are not precise. They vary in individuals by, by some degree. Because real quick, Jay, um, if you're gonna go in there already, um, don't feel like you need to right now, but I'm curious, well, what, what is the actual physical mechanism of this TFUS mm -hmm. um, having an influence on brain function? Is it simply just a physical push from the, the sonic waves? Is changing the like deforming the neuron um, and the dendritic length, axonal length? Uh, what do you think is the actual mechanism going on? Um, so there's sort of three that have been proposed and somewhat accepted. And then there's Stuart Hameroff's number four, which is sometimes talked about and sometimes not. <laughs> um, so the main one is through radiation forces across the lipid bilayer. Uh, so, you know, um, you probably know that as the action potential is propagating, there's some movement along the body of the cell and the, ax and the axons. So when the electricity is jumping from the nodes of RANVA, there's a stretch, and that stretch actually ha ha sort of helps the electricity move. Um, there's some speculation that that physical movement is actually more functional than just helping the jump from the nodes of RANVA. Uh, this is a whole really old field that's sort of rejuvenated in the last couple of years called biomechanical, um, uh, uh, sorry, biomechanical something. It's a, it's a biology field. I can send it around later. Um, but also, you know, I think you're just modulating the cell as it's trying to do its electrical dynamics as well. So you might just be mucking up sort of electrical dynamics by moving it so quickly. Uh, but the Nobel Prize was given last year for uh, two researchers who found that ion channels, there's a couple ion channels that actually have piezo properties. They're called piezo one and piezo two. And uh, so those channels might actually be able to take the mechanical energy and transduce to modulate the ion channels. Um, a little speculation about that because the actual ultrasound wavelength is longer than the ion channel. So I don't think that the wavelength is actually imparting mechanical energy directly on the channel, mm -hmm. but you could be getting uh, jetty forces, some sort of fluid dynamic forces right outside of the cell that are sort of imparting energy through sort of jetty forces and that kind of stuff. Sorry um, if this is too much in the weeds, but I'm curious on the piezoelectric properties. Um, I know from talking to you and, and Maria in the last year or so, there are some aspects of um, the basic you know, composition of the brain that are mm -hmm. piezoelectric, right? So would you include piezoelectric forces in this radiation force category, number one? Yeah, I, I think Maria and I would. I don't think that's being as talked about uh, in the mechanism studies. You know, people are more just thinking about stretching the lipid bilayer. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but I would certainly. Yeah, I, I think there's all kinds of mechanical forces that are acting on the cells that are important for the cell function. Um, then there's this idea of cavitation. So you might actually be causing uh, stable uh, cavitation bubbles within the lipid bilayer, which uh, sounds a little scary, and it is, as, as long as uh, you don't blow that bubble up, so get inertial cavitation, it's fine. Um, and at low energy levels, we have a very good idea of where you would get inertial versus non-inertial cavitation. Uh, but that movement of those bubbles could actually cause ion channels to charge across the cell or disrupt the charges. And that's really depending on the duty cycle. So how long the pulse is actually on for. And so uh, we have good evidence that we can uh, disrupt cellular activity so we can make a cell less likely to fire. But if you actually uh, leave the pulse on longer, you can excite the cell. And if you get to a threshold effect, you can actually cause an action potential. Uh, now that's been shown in animal models that hasn't been shown in humans yet. And I think the reason we haven't like, you know, with TMS, you can put it over the motor cortex and get a muscle movement. You can do that in animals with ultrasound. You haven't been able to do that in humans. And I think it's because we have to go up to an energy level that none of us are feeling safe to do yet on ourselves. 
So there's this sort of like FDA limit for imaging ultrasound, and that's where all of us are staying below. And it looks like you have to go slightly above that limit to get the threshold for, for firing the neuron. Um, but we're, you know, we're, we're sort of animal models are going into that and trying to see if that's safe. And I do think within the next couple of years, we'll see that happening in humans as well. So. Hey, Jay, um, I don't want to derail too much, but like personally, ultrasound kind of freaks me out, like in terms of safety. And I, Flavio, the, the guy I'm working with here at UNC, there's a couple ultrasound people that we're like starting to talk with and stuff. But I don't know, like my personal level, like messing around with Sterling back in the day, he was just like making his own devices. And I don't know, it just it just kind of feels like the Wild West um, to some degree. And like, are there any updates on like the safety of this or um, or how yes. do you feel on that front? That's a great question. I think really important question. Anytime we're talking about putting energy directly in the brain. Uh, you know, this is called non-invasive brain stimulation, but you're putting energy directly in. So there's actually debate about whether you should call this invasive or non-invasive. Um, but, you know, in the labs, in our lab and all the other labs that are publishing, uh, we're staying below the FDA limit for imaging. So it's 720 milliwatts per centimeter square. And there's a lot of literature on the safety bio effects of that across the whole body, including the brain um, from the fetus all the way up. Uh, actually, a lot more information there than, you know, TMS, for example, uh, which I also have some reservations about that we could talk about. Um, but, you know, then there's the question about going above that level to the level of ablation. So you can also use ultrasound to ablate. And we know below 720 milliwatts, we're very unlikely to leave any bio effects. We know above several watts, like 100 watts, you're going to melt the tissue. Um, and that's actually being done by several groups. There's this whole area in between that we're all very interested in. And we know at some point it's dangerous and some point it's safe, but we don't know where that is in that gray area. So I feel highly confident being below about a watt uh, with a, a peak pressure of about one megapascal. Uh, but there's a bunch of caveats even in there. And I think that's where I'm a little bit afraid about the field growing too fast because it's not just about the overall wattage, it's actually how you pulse the energy uh, it's very much true for TMS as well, right? If you pulse too fast, you can increase the likelihood of seizure. Uh, for ultrasound, it's been shown in one rat model, or sorry, one sheep model, that if you pulse too fast without giving a break, you can actually lead to micro hemorrhages um, in two animals, and it hasn't been replicated. And so, you know, there is a bit of like, there is some, you know, pulse parameter that's definitely dangerous, and we're all being super careful to stay below that. But you know, for people at home who are making one of these things and not following the science and not using, I use a $10,000 hydrophone, you know, I, I use all kinds of devices to make sure I'm at these levels. Uh, if you're not doing that, you know, my fear is, yeah, you're gonna damage the brain more than likely. And uh, you know, it's a wild yeah, I, I wanna talk more, but I, I think we should move on to the fun meditation stuff. But, sure. uh, but yeah, I, I feel like with TMS, it's like a seizure, you know, isn't that bad, but destroying brain tissue just feels worse than a seizure to me. So totally, um, but yeah, I, I'm totally fascinated and I, I'm not opposed to using it in my, my own personal future as well. So yeah, well, cool, only man. do it, only use it in the labs for now. <laughs> That's what oh I yeah, saying. yeah. I, I mean, in the lab. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> right. Now I get emails from people who are trying to build these things at home and I'm like, do not build this thing at home. <laughs> like, <laughs> unless you can afford a $10,000 hydrophone and a $20,000 tank and you remove all the gas from the tank and X, Y, and Z, fine. But, you know, the people aren't doing that kind of stuff. So. Um, so, you know, one thing I was saying about reaching deep, so if you're using these low intensity beams, you can get a focus beam of ultrasound that looks about like this shape. So this is a study from Ligon's lab, where they're actually targeting into the thalamus of humans and uh, showing that you could disrupt the somatosensory evoked potentials from the thalamus. Um, so in, in red here, you're just seeing a change in somatosensory evoked potentials. So the beam is quite focused. It's not like on the level of deep brain stimulation at this point, uh, but in the future, you actually could get way more focused than this if you actually deal with the skull. And so, you know, that's one of the interesting things thinking about general resonance theory. I don't know if your theory is talking about deeper brain structures as being more fundamental, 
But, you know, if you really needed to get to some of the deep oscillators, you know, that would definitely be possible with ultrasound. Yeah, we've got to talk through it some more for sure, but I think it's got a lot of promise. Mm -hmm. um, and so just a caveat, you know, Justin, this is probably what everyone's showing you if they're using ultrasound, you know, you get these beautiful pencil beams of energy. Uh, the red region is like the 720 milliwatts. So this, this should be where you're getting modulation of the brain. And of course the beam is traveling through all of this tissue. But you know, this is actually what it's looking like in the brain. And so even if you go to you know, brown bag talks where people are talking about their focused ultrasound, if they're not dealing with the aberration of the skull, this is what the beam is going to look like. Um, this is a lot of modeling, right? Because you really have to make like constructive interference of these yep. 500 kilohertz waves. I mean, right? I mean, yep. that's kind of wild. Yep. So yeah, this is kind of the state of the field right now. And there's lots of folks working on modeling aberration correction. You could use, you know, a helmet of a thousand transducers and focus them down. You know, you could do stuff like that, but you know, then you get into safety concerns and a lot of other things. So, you know, the field's going to be at sort of this resolution for quite a while. Um, and that's kind of, you know, where we are. Uh, but once you deal with that aberration problem, the theoretical limits are very low for ultrasound. So you could get to submillimeter resolution beams. Um, and this is some modeling out of Jamie Tyler's lab. So, you know, direct current is stimulating billions of neurons, I think. <laughs> TMS is stimulating tens of thousands to millions. Ultrasound could get to, you know, sub subcortical areas pretty quickly and, and very small. And, and Jake, given the, um, the current state of the field, is it approximately the same as TMS for the targeting or a bit tighter? Uh, right now, it's probably on the order of TMS, uh, but can go with a bit more depth precision because you can use deep TMS. But when you use deep TMS, you're also modulating a lot of the tissue in between. Um, and that increases the risk of seizure and stuff because of that region, reason. So... It also sort of depends with ultrasound on which piece of skull bone you go through. So the temporal window is much thinner than the rest of the skull. So from the top of the head, that skull is pretty thick, but if you can go through the temporal window, the, the ultrasound resolution is gonna be a little bit better. So targeting like hippocampus, amygdala, insula, you know, those are higher resolution, I think. Um, and lots of fun studies have been coming out. So my collaborator, Sasha Bistritsky at UCLA has woken, uh, or Martin Monti has woken up a few people from coma by uh, trying to jumpstart the thalamocortical loops. So the alpha thalamocortical loop. So these are people with brain damage from you know, motorcycle wrecks and things like that. And uh, they're using this inside of the scanner. So another advantage of ultrasound is you can use it inside of the MRI with very little MRI signal distortion. And uh, they focus the beam right into the thalamus and they try to uh, get the sort of thalamocortical loop back online, which gets more conscious, you know, expression to happen. So they've now done this, uh, I think, in above 10 patients and they've been able to wake up um, all of the patients from minimum coma to at least uh, mid-level, if not completely awake, which is pretty incredible. They published one so far and I think they're about to publish the rest. So okay, uh, I mean, that's yeah. like, that's wild. It's crazy, right? And when the first they, patient they came like out- They like cured coma. <laughs> crazy, right? Yeah, you gotta hear Martin. I mean, you look up some of his YouTube videos, hear him talk about some of these stuff. It's a, he's basically about to cry when he talks about these patients. But, you know, with one patient, it was like, all right, maybe he woke up by himself or whatever. But now they've done multiple patients and they've all sort of raised their level of consciousness. Uh, but that's really neat because, you know, that also is testing the idea that the thalamocortical loop is really related to conscious states as well. So that, really, that's not published yet, right? The, uh, the follow-up to the case study here? No, I think they're trying to get their sample size up a bit higher and follow up the patients as well because they want to know how long does this last. So, yeah, so pretty impressive. You're going to start seeing a lot more of this stuff coming out with ultrasound in the next couple of years. Um, so there's Stuart Tamaroff. Uh, I know Stuart's uh, theory of quantum consciousness has a little bit of overlap with what you guys have been talking about. So uh, why did I get involved in ultrasound in the first place? Well, Stuart uh, has this idea about microtubules being involved in consciousness. And the microtubules have a resonant frequency in the megahertz range. Uh, this is based on some work by Anurban Banayupe. 
And so Stuart, you know, being an anesthesiologist, like literally was like, all right, let's just put one of these ultrasounds up to the head. If the microtubules are involved in consciousness and we resonate them or oscillate them, uh, we should be able to change the conscious state. And so that's kind of how all this started at the University of Arizona. Here's Stuart's brain. You can see his skull and a little bit of brain tissue in this ultrasound system. And uh, Stuart's first study was actually to look at whether he could modulate chronic pain perception in pain patients. And the basic finding was that he uh, reduced pain perception by ultrasounding the prefrontal cortex, uh, but it wasn't a significant effect, but he actually changed people's mood. So chronic pain patients mood by doing this. And uh, when I was in graduate school, we were really interested in mood and depression. And so uh, we ran about 300 subjects. We're one of the biggest uh, you know, number of subjects that we've run uh, with ultrasound. And we basically replicated that by targeting pain centers in the brain with ultrasound, we could elevate people's mood. We could take people who are depressed and we could at least temporarily uh, put them in a better mood state. And uh, in one depression trial by targeting uh, the prefrontal cortex, we we're actually able to do five days of ultrasound on depressed people and change their depression and anxiety scores. Um, so whether that's due to microtubule modulation or not, we're not sure, but this is sort of Stuart's first uh, attempt to test his microtubule theory of consciousness is what sort of led me to get into all this stuff in the first place. Um, Jay, um, yeah. is there, so uh, Stu ha had a particular prediction about the frequency that would be necessary to stimulate the microtubules, is that right? Uh, so three and a half megahertz or thereabout. Uh, but the system he used was two megahertz and eight megahertz. And we actually never tested three and a half megahertz. <laughs> so, so it looked like in the megahertz range was fine. And now we're actually using half a megahertz, so 0.5 kilohertz in the lab. So, I mean, wouldn't you think if, if it was microtubules that the doing it at the appropriate frequency would have at least a bigger effect than at, at any other frequency? It's a really good question. We tried, so we did do some pilot tests with three megahertz to four megahertz. Uh, we found a general effect across all the frequencies. And part of the question was, you know, at the higher fundamental frequencies, you get less and less ultrasound through the skull. So going down to five kilohertz, 500 kilohertz, you get way more energy. And maybe that's just the reason we're seeing these effects. So, so it's a good question, but we're just not sure. But it's not that problematic for him that it doesn't matter? No, uh, because I think for Stuart, it's not just three and a half megahertz. I think multiple megahertz frequencies would, would modulate the, the microtubules and it depends on the microtubules you're looking at. Okay. But we'd have to ask Stu. Uh, so I know we're running out of time. Maybe I will skip to our current work. So basically we started taking this ultrasound brain simulation stuff and trying to modulate different networks in the brain that we actually think are interfering with equanimity. <clears throat> and uh, I chose the default mode network system because I know you guys, especially Jonathan, thought a lot about DMN. So I think you know quite a bit about the default mode network. It's related to mind wandering, rumination. Um, in our lab, we're really interested in the default mode network in relation to uh, dysfunction. So like depression and anxiety, for example. Um, and we know that in people with depression, for example, you'll see overactivation of the default mode network, at least for subtypes of um, certain types of depression. On the flip side, if you take people who are long-term mindfulness practitioners and you put them in the scanner and ask them to meditate, you actually see less default mode network activation so what you're seeing here is different types of long-term meditators over 20 years relative to controls. And relative to controls, you just see the classic DMN networks less active, uh, which is pretty neat. And importantly, what you tend to see is long-term practitioners, uh, default mode networks actually hyper-connect to control centers in the brain. So it's not that you're just uh, having less default mode network connectivity, uh, which is like, you wouldn't wanna just completely not have a default mode network. It's actually a relevant system to have. It's important for long-term memory and a lot of other things. But what you're seeing is that when they're in, when long-term meditators are in the default state, they actually have another connection to control centers, which actually helps them flexibly switch out of the default system. Um, and you can see that if you give them a task. 
And so we've been really interested in this idea of default mode network flexibility and whether we can actually use the ultrasound to help people learn this type of flexibility faster. Um, there's a really cool study out of, um, out of uh, Judd Brewer's lab from 2013, where they were trying to link the phenomenology reports to the ongoing activation of the default mode network. So what you're seeing is actually what the participant was seeing in real time in the scanner. And blue means less posterior cingulate activation relative to baseline, red means more. And these are long-term practitioners or beginner practitioners trying to meditate in the scanner. And they were feeding back basically the brain activation to help them sort of get into those states faster. And what you tended to see in long-term meditators is that over 30 minutes, they could quote, sink into the practice, right? So they're trying to practice meditation. And now you're seeing the default mode network, especially the posterior cingulate, like really sort of going less and less relative to baseline. And uh, importantly, this sort of notion of not doing or effortless doing really seemed to be the biggest phenomenology correlation to the decreased network connectivity. Um, now that's really related to equanimity. And when Judd Brewer talks about this, he really relates it to this sort of openness to the experience, the sort of um, you know, ability to sort of let the experience pass without getting caught up in that experience. Now, when you ask what it looks like for a beginner meditator, it's the opposite pattern. So these are people just learning to meditate that day. You put them in the scanner and then you try to get them to meditate for 30 minutes. Now they're activating their default mode network. They're getting frustrated. They're probably thinking about like, I hate this study. I wanna get out of the study. Um, so kind of relating the phenomenology of beginning meditation to that default mode network. Uh, and really you can see for 14 subjects, they were really sort of not happy. <laughs> AJ, yeah, yeah, a couple of questions off of this. So cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Question one. I mean, typically it's thought that that you can willingly do neurofeedback on any part of the brain. So th is this is this like an anomaly to that principle where this is a because it's tied to self awareness in some weird way when you try to down down regulate it, you can't do it. Uh, I think it was part of the task because they weren't really trying to do neurofeedback as much as link the phenomenology to the activation. So they thought of this as like mm. a neuro neurophenomenology study. And the task was really meditate. Um, and so it might've been that the internal process of, of trying to meditate overrode the sort of neurofeedback um, effect. Sure. Although it could be, it was just so hard that neurofeedback just didn't work for beginners in the beginning. Whereas for the meditators, it's likely the neurofeedback was actually feeding back and working for them. Um, Cause they, you know, I know, I know a lot of the subjects who were in the study and they actually liked being in the scanner quite a bit. Um, gotcha. So it's like, yeah, like a synergy of the meditation and the, and the neurofeedback maybe. I think so. And we're actually finding the same thing for ultrasound. Long-term meditators love having their PCC inhibited. I mean, they just mm. absolutely mm -hmm. like, it seems to really interact with their practice in some type of interesting oh, way. Cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay question, wait, uh, wait. Second question real the quick. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. No, so, ahead. so the the two main hubs of the default mode are like PCC and medial prefrontal. Is there a reason you and the, and these groups have only ever focused on PCC? I know, like, I I, I don't know. It, it seems like the literature is pretty murky on distinguishing. Yeah, it's a great question. The PCC uh, shows up more for long term meditation studies. Uh, medial prefrontal shows up as well, but really out of Judd studies, for example, this is the only region that sort of uh, correlated across all the subjects. I think that's partly because medial prefrontal is likely more involved in maintaining the integrity of the default mode network. Whereas PCC is really the orchestrator of all the bits that you gotta get together to be in the default state. And of course the contents of the default state are quite different even within a subject across moment to moment. So sometimes you're thinking about dinner, sometimes you're planning for the future, sometimes you're thinking about the past. Those are all sort of different networks. You know, we got uh, Jessica Andrews Hanna, the default mode network researcher. She's actually in our, in our faculty now. So, you know, this is the PCC and medial prefrontal sort of hubs. And there's all these sub networks that are related to the different types of default states that you can go in. And so I think PCC is really organizing like which ones are brought up and then medial prefrontal kind of keeps that coherence going. 
Um, so that's, that's kind of one theory about you know, what, what's going on here. The other thing though, is that PCC is the most energy intensive brain region in the entire brain. So visual cortex as a whole uses more energy, but if you're just in one region, the PCC is using more than any other brain region. Mm -hmm. And it's the only region that you will not get a stroke in. So go through the literature and try to find me someone who's had a stroke in the PCC. I still can't find it. I'm really looking. I know there's gotta be a case somewhere out there, but it really looks like evolution has protected the crap out of this brain area for some reason. And I think that's a clue about the importance of whatever it's really doing for so self organization. Yeah, there's never been like an epileptic PCC that got resected or anything. There has been there has been that. Yeah. So there's a couple of those. And we've we've just compiled a bunch of those types of studies. But uh, yeah, it's a very protected region. It's using a lot of energy. And uh, the other reason, you know, if you look at the psychedelic studies, I was going to skip this, but the more ego death you have, the more PCC particularly is turning down. And so when you look at these like psilocybin, LSD, 5-MeO, DMT studies, you know, people who report like extremely intense ego death, you'll see that PCC region really being the one who's correlated with that ego death. And then if you look at long-term effects, so like up to four months, for example, in these studies, the more all of this happens, the more you get these long-term behavior changes that are positive for people. So, you know, if you start looking across like, you know, the sort of psychopathology literature, the meditation literature and the psychedelic literature, uh, you start really seeing something's going on with the PCC particularly. That's super interesting. A quick question there, Jay. Mm -hmm. um, big question, maybe, maybe quick, maybe not. Um, so in my limited understanding, it seems like the DMN is, um, you know, evolutionarily the, obviously by definition, the default mode of our, you know, our mind state, um, which would include evolutionarily speaking, you know, a certain level of anxiety and alertness to the environment around us. It seems like when we turn that DMN down, looking at the PCC as kind of the orchestrator of the DMN, that we have less anxiety, less unhappiness, more feelings of well-being. Does that all make sense to you? Would you agree with that generalized statement? Uh, generally, yeah. It does seem like, you know, the studies show that people spend about 43% of their time in the default mode network. So if you can get a person to spend a little less time, that's usually correlated with positive health outcomes, less anxiety, less rumination. But often that's also coupled with some type of intervention like mindfulness training, cognitive behavior therapy. So the sort of relationship between what's causing what, I think it still isn't really worked out. And you know, with, with meditators, for example, it's not, it's not like negative thoughts are bad or anxiety is bad. The very useful states actually, it's when they stick around and you start ruminating on them, you know, that's right. when it becomes the pathology. So I think it's, kind of thing. yeah, it's more of disrupting that habit that can form, that's trying to sort of protect the person from whatever trauma or stress or whatever's happening in the environment. And in making your 20, in your 2020 paper I included with the email, mm -hmm. um, you talk about finding um, a lower functional connectivity correlates with increased feelings of well being. So, would that be because you have lower connectivity in the default mode network under this kind of generalized view I sketched out? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's probably related to that flexibility more than anything. So it's that you're overall having less connectivity and less time in the DMN, but that's because you're able to disengage from it when you need to. So when, when someone, when a loved one's talking to you, you got to stop ruminating about Russia for a minute, pay attention to them. That gives you more connection. That connection actually helps you deal with the fact that you're afraid of Russia. <laughs> you know, So it's that kind of relationship between getting out of the system, I think more than anything. I do also just want to uh, mention that it's also associated with, uh, with creativity as is uh, yep. mind wandering. So um, you wouldn't want to turn it off uh, right. entirely. Right. And actually what you find is that if you compare long-term meditators to controls, not meditating, the DMNs are the same. So it's only when they're trying to meditate that you see less DMN, right? So I think that's really important. And that's a really good point, Jonathan. It's like, you could probably just have a device that closed loop stimulates you out of DMN, but then you're probably just going to be less creative, probably actually not going to be able to lay down long-term memories as well, especially autobiographical memories. So yeah, again, you wouldn't want to just turn it off. 
um, or I don't know, maybe it would. It's up to you, but <laughs> or I have the option to turn it off, or, or yeah. turn it on, right? Depends on your goals, right? If your goal is to be more creative, you don't want to turn it off. So. <laughs> Um, I mean, it's kind of wild. We we really should only be doing like state-based interventions in psychiatry. You know, the the idea that you would ever want to turn off or activate any region chronically, it's probably just totally misguided. You know, I think kind of I think that. that is a really important point, and it's something I make both to people who are interested in neurostimulation and psychedelics that the brain's always changing and it's learning, and there's reward-based learning happening all the time. So. Yeah, the context of what you do the intervention in is as important as the intervention. And if you're able just to remove a state without thinking about the context, yeah, you're going to add artificial intelligence on top of it. And then the world gets weird really quickly for people. <laughs> so yeah, you have to be super careful with this stuff. Um, so, okay, so I'll just tell you a little bit about the uh, PCC study that we've been doing. So this is our system in the lab. Uh, it's a focused ultrasound system where we can change the focal depth. We're using navigation with people's MRIs. So we basically take an MRI, we put the ultrasound on their head. Uh, this is Brian, our grad student, getting the ultrasound. And so you can see the uh, beam of energy is being sort of focused based on his structural MRI. And then we focus it down to the PCC. So this is a sort of idealized case where we're not having any aberration correction, but we basically put a seed down in the PCC for that individual brain. And right now we're targeting based on structure. So we find the sort of structural PCC piece, but in the future, we're actually gonna get people to activate their default mode network in a task and actually use the functional scans to target. So I think that's kind of where we need to get to to actually make this more effective for people. Um, but right now we're just doing it based on structure. And uh, the basic paradigm is we do uh, baseline scans. We take them out of the scanner in this study and do ultrasound, and then we put them back in. And the current studies are actually doing ultrasound inside of the scanner, but you know, I'm not going to show you that now. And then we basically uh, ask them a bunch of questions about how they feel. So uh, one of those scales that we give is a mindfulness scale called the Toronto Mindfulness Scale. It's a really crappy scale, I think, for measuring mindfulness, but you know, we got to use something. And uh, what we're starting to find actually is that on a subscale of this called decentering, which we think is somewhat related to equanimity, the more decreased connectivity we see between within the default mode network, basically, uh, the more decentering we get. And it's actually correlated. So these subjects out here had the biggest change in DMN and they reported the biggest decentering. Uh, so that's pretty cool, actually. And as you can see, not all the subjects get the effect, and that's probably for lots of different reasons. But the people who do seem to get the big effects, it does seem to drive them towards more decentering. And our placebo control group, which is a different group, uh, we just see no change, basically, which is quite nice. <clears throat> what about an overall um, correlation between um, DMN connectivity and decentering? Um, overall correlation, good question. We do see that effect as well. So oh. yeah, it's not quite as strong. I think I show this because it's a stronger <laughs> effect. But, yeah, well, there's a hint this of that. also speaks to, the other one would just be showing that decentering is associated with DMNN connectivity where this is showing the intervention. Yeah, yeah, so we see that as well. Uh, we also gave a couple scales that come out of the psychedelic literature, uh, which might've, um, prime subjects in a bit to think about their internal states in a way that they wouldn't without these scales. So you sort of have to take that as a caveat. But we, we ask them a bunch of questions like I lost my sense of ego, you know, stuff like that. And I've plotted the biggest questions on this radar plot. So placebo is in the middle and each of these is two on the scale. Um, so I can plot over this, the psychedelic studies and what you would see is LSD would be out here, for example, a big change. <laughs> But uh, for the stimulation subjects, we actually see significant changes in time perception, uh, inner peace, which was quite surprising, uh, experience having a dreamlike quality. And really interestingly, a lot of subjects reported more experiences from the past. So they did have a DMN experience, but what they were saying is that the thoughts didn't stick, which is quite interesting. So it's not like we turned off the DMN, but it does seem like we disrupted its ability to maintain its integrity, uh, which is quite interesting and really important for us. This didn't make people feel weird and it wasn't a bad experience. So 
that's something we're always sort of worried about. We want to make sure this is okay for people. Jay, um, do you have a sense of um, how blind the uh, participants were to what they were, which whether they were getting placebo or, or stimulation? It's a great question. In this study, it's a single blind. So the subjects are blind, but the researcher wasn't. Um, they don't hear or feel anything from ultrasound, although in some cases, the sound waves can vibrate the skull slightly, so you get bone conduction. I don't know if you've ever seen those bone conduction headphones that like athletes mm -hmm. wear sometimes. Mm -hmm. So you get the same effect from ultrasound, um, and young people can hear it. So if you're under the age of 30, sometimes your hearing can, can pick that up. Uh, so we ask people, what condition do you think you were in? Did you hear any sounds? Did you feel anything? And any of that kind of stuff. And everyone's at chance at guessing. So. That's great. Very good. And then in the scanner, when we do this now, they can't hear anything because they'll MRI right. so, so loud. So, right. so yeah, no guess there, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, the people who are in the STEM condition had a little higher likelihood. It was still at chance, but, you know, pushing up a little bit because they felt something. They actually, you know, were feeling some type of effect. Um, these people were non-meditators, so they'd never meditated, never used psychedelics. And so their phenomenology is quite fresh in a sense. Um, and so, you know, I don't think they had a good sort of phenomenology language even for describing what was happening to them. But we did have a couple subjects report, like after we sort of asked, you know, what was it like? Was it okay for you? A couple of people actually said, you know, I didn't know that my thoughts didn't have to be followed, or I didn't know that I didn't have to listen to my thoughts. And that, that gave us chills, because that's like sort of first level mindfulness yeah. insight, right? We're like, holy shit, are you kidding? Like, are you sure you're not a meditator? You know, that's kind of stuff we're like, this is like what a meditator would report. Um, and we've actually followed up with all of these people. So we do safety studies to make sure that this is okay. And a couple of people have actually integrated meditation practice because um, we do debrief them and tell them this is about meditation and all that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, we've had a couple subjects actually pick up a practice. So <laughs> for what that's worth, it's pretty cool. Hey, Jay, I mean, this is such cool research. Um, what is like the scale here? So when they say felt profound inner peace, are we looking at an average of three out of 10 or like seven out of 10? uh two four six like how, oh, sorry this is three? one two three this is five i have another scale i don't show this publicly but i've plotted this with psychedelics and i don't show it publicly because i don't want people to think i'm like replacing psychedelics but if you look at a uh, low dose of psilocybin is right in the same level as this actually so oh, okay. like a not a micro dose but one of those like mid-level types of doses um, a big dose of LSD then pops way out here for all of this and a little bit of fear and stuff comes out as well. So it's not on the magnitude of like a ego melt, <laughs> you know, but which is what we wouldn't want. You know, we would have to report mm -hmm. that to the IRB if something like that happened. <laughs> uh, but it's definitely on the level of a small, small dose of, of something like that. Which is but it's hard. like a pretty quick trip or it's only when it's when it's happening. Uh, so that's a great question. I, okay, here's my results for the MRI. So um, if you look at default mode network connectivity changes, we see immediate changes in the stimulation group. But we also see these changes lasting for 20 minutes. And that's actually true for our past studies with mood as well. So it looks like there's a window, which I think is like a window of plasticity change or connectivity change, where they are altered. You know, the brain connectivity seems to be altered. And then after about an hour, they're back to baseline. Um, and so getting to your point about coupling with intervention, I think what happens to this brain in that 20 an hour is the most important piece. So as important as these state changes is now you've got this increased connectivity change. Like if you're training your brain with meditation, great. If you go sit down in front of Facebook and Facebook algorithm is sitting that sitting there like, detecting that you've changed <laughs> like that's probably also going to change your brain in some different way so yeah we're, we're thinking about you know basically keeping the subjects and making sure that they do some type of brain training in the in this window it's like the it same like you've got a bunch of the tms oh sorry sorry Jonathan. i was just gonna say it looks like you've got a bunch of regions that responded yes so what you're looking at on the right is uh, seed-based connectivity. So the seed is the PCC and everything in blue is decreased connectivity to the PCC. 
uh, that's where we targeted with the ultrasound. And in the little line here, you see the default mode network areas, but also you see precuneus saliently. And precuneus is very related to self and no self and those types of states as well. Uh, we see the uh, DLPFC in the, in the right inferior frontal gyrus, which is the other area that I've sonicated in other studies. Um, and then we see increased connectivity between PCC and visual cortex and somatosensory cortex. So that suggests that they are going from an internal attentional state to an external attentional state, which is what sort of half of the DMN field would argue. Um, but we also see some things that sort of are a little different than what would be predicted if we inhibit this. So, yeah, yeah wow. this, this is so interesting. And, uh, the, the role of the precuneus and the posterior cingular cortex that, that makes a ton of sense. I know that these are two pieces of the DMN that are responsible for kind of shifts between egocentric perspective and allocentric. So like self-focused yep. versus, uh, okay. third person perspective. So, but, yeah. um, my own kind of theory on this is potentially, you know, with the decreased activity in the, the local drive of the brain and maybe tapping into potentially even like a non-local field of consciousness. What, what are you guys' feelings on that? Okay, I'll be on about two minutes. Uh, uh, yes, I think that's a really good point. And actually, I don't, we've done some modeling work, which I don't think I have. Okay, so here's getting to... Uh, Andrew, all your stuff, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> um, I don't have the modeling stuff in here, but the model actually is suggesting that our beam may not be getting all the energy into the PCC, which is what we're targeting, mm -hmm. that some of that energy is actually being pulled back by the skull towards the precuneus. Mm -hmm. And that would actually explain some of like this time distortion stuff and this kind of non-local, you know, they kind of there's some stuff about like merging people had as well. So their kind of body states got a little bit distorted. Mm -hmm. And that would be more of like precuneous inhibition more than PCC. But mm -hmm. also these things are hyper connected as well. So inhibiting one will inhibit the connectivity to the other. Um, but I'm very interested. I have a friend, Zoran uh, Zasapic, who is really interested in precuneous and non-local, um, non-dual experiences. And Zoran's very skeptical like you, Justin. He's like, oh, I'm not going to do this on myself. Uh, but Zoran's like, if you do it on someone else, do it on the free beauty. <laughs> so, this is so, so awesome. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's another one we want to do. Um, so anyway, here's Shenzhen. We're combining this right now with EEG. And so that's, you know, a place where I think we could overlap quite a bit with the, the ideas about the GRT and whether we could drive some of these oscillations and what types of oscillations we would want to drive to change some of these conscious states. So... One really cool thing I'll say about ultrasound too is that we get no signal distortion in EEG, like pretty much none. So, you know, unlike with TMS or TACS, you're going to wash out your amplifier for EEG for, you know, at least 200 milliseconds or something like that. With ultrasound, we can see in real time as we're sonicating. So you should look at entrainment. entrainment. Yeah. We're, we're moving there. Yeah. That's we're actually the, able to, like most people can't even yeah study that. that's wow. that's exciting everything i've showed you right now is like you know is like version 0 0.001 like once you get to entrainment like that's really where the fun stuff is going to start happening and you know mm -hmm. I, I think you guys would all agree with that so mm -hmm. that's what brian's working on maybe we can get brian the grad student in the lab to come talk about this at some point that'd be great but, you know once we get there then the question is what oscillations do we target you know and and sort of how do we start thinking about you know targeting these different systems Hey, Jay, I just got to say, I really appreciate your like bravery to do research <laughs> that you really feel passionately about, even if there's not a huge base for this. And like, I'm sure you might face criticism from like the strict NIH type people, you know, and so I just think it's so cool that you're really following your passion and doing like really rigorous science. So thank you. Just like really cool example, you know, thank you. Yeah, well, you know, we've been lucky to get some private donors in the lab who funded all this and, and you know, help, you know, deal with us talking about these things, too, because there's a lot of uh, negative stuff that can that can pop up around this. And, you know, having Shenzhen in the lab is really helpful because he helps people, you know, on long term retreats deal with a lot of this stuff. And, you know, like we're now learning that 66 percent of people who go to retreat actually have adverse events. 
totally okay as long as you deal with it up front, you know? And I think that's why it's important to start doing this stuff in the labs before these big companies start promising all this uh, exponential happiness to people. So I appreciate that. And I appreciate the ability, you know, to have the space to do it on a campus and do it carefully and talk about all this stuff that can come up as well. Yeah. So thanks. Thanks so much, Jay. That was an amazing talk and discussion. Uh On behalf of the entire General Wrestling Studio team, I'd like to thank you for watching. Don't forget to like this video, share it with your friends and colleagues, add a comment, and subscribe for additional content. We'll see you next time.